This is the GPL Podcast, sponsored by Vintage Minnesota Hockey, your exclusive source for throwback Minnesota jerseys. Visit VintageMNHockey.com. Now, here's Hammy, Vigo, and your host, Jupiter. Good evening and welcome to another GPL podcast. We're back at full strength this week after uh, Hammy took last week off. Hammy, how you doing? Not too bad, yeah. Well, I wouldn't call it uh, taking <laughs> it off. Let's just say the real job kind of came into play, so I had to, had to have priorities. You know, that's the one that actually pays me a lot more than this one does. So. Uh, I don't blame you there. Stuff happens and you just got to take care of things. Viggs, how you doing? Doing well. Enjoyed uh, the last North Star College Cup. The last North Star College Cup. Well, there you go. Starting the conversation already, and boy, uh, kind of an interesting game Friday night against Duluth. You know, I thought, you know, the first period, eh. Second period, all Duluth. Third period, all Minnesota. But what matters in the end is in that third period when Minnesota was trying to get back in, there was a goal scored for each side, and nothing really changed. So, uh, Vig, your initial thoughts against number one Duluth? I thought we saw how good both teams can be. Um, I think the the difference was Hunter Miska looked really good in that third period when Minnesota was pushing, and Minnesota didn't get a lot of second chances. Whether it was they uh, couldn't get any rebounds, or Miska didn't give them any opportunities or they weren't getting enough guys, you know, crashed in the net, getting that presence. You know, they just didn't have enough to quite get over the hump on that. What do you think, Hammy? Can Minnesota stick with well, this team or is Duluth uh, what everybody thinks they are? Uh, well, I definitely think they can stick with Duluth. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, you look at Duluth, I mean, obviously they've had a lot of success this year, but I wouldn't exactly, you, you look at that lineup, and I wouldn't exactly say, oh, my God, you know, they got a bunch of superstars that are just light in the sky. And they've got a good team depth-wise. And obviously, uh, they've been getting some very good goaltending. Um, so that, I think they're a good team, of course. But uh, I don't see a team that's, like, really going to blow you away as far as, you know, you can stay in games with them. I really think that uh, the Gophers just didn't have a consistent 60 minutes. And, um they had played, you know, the game like they had that last period. You know, it would have been a different story, but um, it just didn't happen for them this time. And you know, and I think that I, I think it's funny watching fans. Um, you know, the whole GPL thing I mean, during games, I, it, it kills me that when I read the, like the next day some of the in-game comments and how people are just freaking out about things and. There's just a real lack of <laughs> lack of kind of a big picture vision. During uh, the heat of a game, so boy, it's I I completely agree with that. It got to the point, you know, I got home late that night, and I'm like, okay, people, step away from your phone, step away from your computer, take a break off of Twitter for a while. And uh, Viggs, you also had it firsthand, didn't you, with uh, the social media <laughs> Friday night and Saturday? Well, it was kind of funny because I watched the game a little bit on delay on DVR, mm-hmm. so you know, it was kind of my relaxation for the night was to watch that game. Uh, and it was quite entertaining. I thought Minnesota answered the bell pretty good against Minnesota Duluth. You know, it's just those couple turnovers that, that cost him. I think that was the lesson yep. that they have to take away from it is, you know, when you're playing teams, you know, at the top of the country, if you make mistakes, you know, they have the talent to, to make you pay. You know, Avery Peterson converted that breakaway goal that was huge. Um, they got that 5 on 3 and, and scored on the power play. You know, those are mistakes you can't really make when you're playing a top team like that. Uh, the reaction on social media is part of being a fanatic, I think. Yeah. You know, you watch on GPL and people uh, ride the roller coaster oh, with this team. Yeah. The fire Lucia crap, and I'm like, oh, come on, people. Hey, yeah, I mean, mean, ultimately, you have to look. I mean, it, it pairwise rankings wise, I mean, they're in good shape. I mean, they're right now they are. I mean, obviously they, they continue to win, but um, it's not like this is some team that's been floundering. This is not exactly the you know, the Lucia teams, you know, in about six, seven, 
or what odd years ago where you know we were having that streak of a couple of years where they were struggling and you know all that i mean it, i understand the expectations are high and of course we always want to win and especially you always want to win against in-state opponents and you know some of the rivals and all that but um i wouldn't exactly say that they completely laid an egg in that game and it's like i get it if they completely flopped but that just isn't what happened so it, it people need to have some perspective well, they definitely do, but uh, you know, the one encouraging thing, though, I, I guess we could say, Viggs, though, is that, uh, boy, that third period, you know, shots twenty-two to two. Um, unfortunately, you know, if Shearhorn makes that breakaway save, may have been a different story, but uh, they did show that they can dominate um, when they need to, or or they can yeah. dominate at times, and, and you know, and show that they can stick with these top teams you know it's it's kind of sad we're saying that because we're used to being one of those top teams and they should be playing with us but obviously it's a process here well you know they come into that game two and 17 in their their last 19 in-state games you know so you can't really come into that game with the swagger and confidence or pride on ice you know when you're two and 17 your last 19 that's non-existent you know you're trying to build yourself from the ground up and I thought that was a great way to, to build up their game. You know, they, they had a lot of possession. They got the defense involved in the offensive cycle. You know, they were great on faceoffs. Um, you know, they drew the power play late in the period. Uh, I thought it was a pretty dominating period for them. It, it was good to see. You know, and they took it into the next game. And despite that opening minute, they had another game where there was never really a doubt Mm-hmm. Once they got past the three breakaways they gave up, that they were in control of that game. Yeah, uh, Lucia, you were right there. Lucia was kind of sort of laughing about the, the three breakaways, that he, he ran out of defensive pairs because they all gave up a break in that first couple minutes of that game against Bemidji State. Well, I mean, that first minute, you're just <laughs> wondering what the heck's going on. I mean, that you can't look at it any different. You know, the team just was not ready to go, and it was every pair of defensemen. And well, not just, just defensemen, obviously. Recover. Obviously, the, the forwards got to cover as well. But uh, 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 Shearhorn definitely saved their bacon at the beginning of the game because against a team like uh, Bemidji State, obviously they're not a powerhouse, but they can play defense very well. And if they get the lead, um, Minnesota's in trouble in that game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Bemidji has statistically the best defense in the country. So getting that first goal was really important for Minnesota. You know, it didn't come until the second period, but they, they didn't turn the puck over very much. Uh, Bemidji had, did have some looks in the third period, but uh, Shearhorn stood tall. He did, and I think he got about his third shutout of the season. So uh, um, I guess that's a good sign. He wasn't terrible against uh, Minnesota Duluth. Uh, um uh, Maybe, I don't know, I, I guess there's really nothing, you know, maybe if he could have stopped that, that breakaway, but you know what, breakaways are not on him. He's just the last line of defense. So, you know, overall, Shearhorn had a pretty good weekend. Um, but like you said, in, in the Duluth game, it was just it was just mistakes that killed, and turnovers and just, you know, bad, you know, the five-on-three bad penalties. And, and it seems like they did kind of come back in, uh, in that second game, and, and they just – kind of just play their game they withstood that first minute but they just stayed patient finally got a goal in the second and then a few more in the third and, and got, the, got the four nothing win and you know finally a win in the north star cup which they hadn't had since uh the game one isn't it was it like game one yeah the minnesota ago? state a, game and yeah the opening yeah that was the first time they had won a game in the, in the north star cup since game one uh four years ago so I, I guess, you know, a, a split on the weekend, a really good effort against Minnesota Duluth, and, and then obviously a 4 nothing win over Bemidji States is uh, at least uh, pretty good in my, in my mind. I don't disagree. I mean, I think that you, obviously, everybody wants to win every game, and um, I, I just think it's, for me, the frustration gets to be with some of the defensemen um, that's where I tend to get frustrated, especially with the turnovers. Um, uh, at this level, I, I, I get it if you're getting a lot of pressure and things just happen, but sometimes it's just, just mental mistakes, and that's what 
is unfortunately the frustrating thing. And you see some of that end up in the back of the net, and everybody kind of wants to blame the goalie, of course, at the end of the day when I look at the save percentage. But um, there are there have been several games where he hasn't had a lot of favors from his teammates. Well, uh, obviously, we it is the end of the North Star Cup. It was a four-year experiment. It didn't really turn out the way that a lot of teams uh, wanted it to turn out as. Um, uh, Viggs, you kind of t- you, you wrote an article last, what was it, last Friday, I think uh, you wrote, uh, on GPL. Yep, I about put up the, on Friday afternoon before the tournament. Yeah, about the, the death of the tournament. And uh, why don't you share some of your thoughts that you did, had in the article there? Well, I just think that there was a lot of blame being placed on Minnesota, you know, not being able to keep this event going. There was a lot of blame from people about it being a money grab by the University of Minnesota. And while the Gophers do have the advantage of it being at Excel, it's not a home game for this team. And, you know, as history has shown lately, you know, it's not really a very big advantage for them to play on the smaller rink. Um, So they're giving up, you know, the ability for, St. Cloud, Mankato, Duluth, uh, Bemidji to sell their own tickets for the event. And every ticket they sold in that first phase, they got to keep all the revenue. Uh, when Mankato held that game at Excel during the lockout, you know they made $140,000 that year in, in profit. And I think their revenue for the entire year was like $1.1 $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity, I think, for those other schools to sell tickets and get some revenue for a great t- a tournament. You know, you've got two of the top ten teams in the country playing with Minnesota and Minnesota Duluth this year. You've got the WCHA's best team in Bemidji, and you have a team in St. Cloud who you know has a World Junior Championship winning coach and a pretty good team You know that's on the bubble of the pairwise for making the tournament. So it's a good product on ice. Uh, people are upset with FSN for not broadcasting the entire tournament. Well, FSN already has contracted with the Gophers to show those games. So they own those rights, and they're going to show those games. You know, the other schools had the opportunity to contract FSN to broadcast the games, and they chose not to. Um, so I think there's a lot of criticism there that's kind of short-sighted. You know, Duluth wanted out of this event. They want the home games since they've opened their new arena. Uh, they're rolling in the dough. Their revenues went from about one and a half million to three million a year. So they would rather be playing in Duluth for two extra games and making the money there. So if people don't want to blame Minnesota, you know, I think it's probably just that, you know, angst towards the University of Minnesota. It's not it's misdirected. It shouldn't be at the North Star Cup. I think you're being actually probably kind. I think it's ignorance is what it is. I mean when you have to tell people about the TV situation, you know, and because they're barking and whining about the fact that the, some of the other games aren't on, and they're just completely unaware of the fact that the opportunities are there, it's just whether their school stepped up and wanted to provide the opportunity to FSN, I mean, it just tells you it's ignorance. I mean, they think that FSN is basically, um, you know, essentially go for TV, you know what I mean? And it's like, well... We, as we've seen in recent years, they've been broadcasting other teams' games. It's just really a matter of do they give them the opportunity to broadcast those games or not. And if they're not on, it's not because the Gophers run the show. It's because of other reasons. And, um, you know, so it, like I said, it's always been that way, though. I mean, it's just there's a level of ignorance, and people think, I mean, yeah, I get people hate the Gophers. You know, the other teams and their fans hate the Gophers. We all know that, but it it kind of blinds them in a sense and makes them ignorant to what some of the reality actually is. So you're being kind, I think, to some of these people. Well, it just seems crazy to me that the other schools in this event didn't really make any effort to make it work. You know, when Mankato had their game at Excel, they had 18 buses of fans come up for the game, free round trip transportation, and they made over $100,000 on the game. You know, it's an opportunity for those schools to reach out their, to their alumni and have events for this, um, just like Mankato did that one time or the way that North Dakota did during the Final Five. I think it was just a short-sighted missed opportunity by all those schools and fans. Well, it, you also have to remember, I don't think, I mean, the it is a, a nice tournament, don't get me wrong, but I also think that people 
you know, it, it, it is, it was kind of a half assed attempt to try to capture more of a bean pot feel and all that. And, um, you know, you're just not going to replicate those kinds of things as much as it might be a good tournament and with good teams. I don't know. I think there's, there's gotta be more to it. I think maybe the fans here, you know, because of all the rivalries over the years and some of the things that have gone on, I just think that you're going to have to find more reasons for them than to just try to rehash a tournament that's been very successful out East. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Look, I want to get to some of the questions. We've got a bunch of questions into us, and this one actually relates to the North Star Cup. Uh, Eric Burton, old goon, our favorite uh, North Dakota fan, he wants to know, so can we blame the NCHC on the downfall of the NSCC? I'll hang up and listen, he says. Feeks, it's all their fault, isn't it? <laughs> it's clearly all their fault, <laughs> you know. The NCHC tried to make a money grab conference as much as they did, and it's done very well for Duluth and St. Cloud. I, I posted their financials uh, last week when people are making fun of the Gophers, and uh, it's been good for them. Um, but it's a money grab. It's it's too bad for Minnesota State and Bemidji that they're you know in this WCHA league that has a lot of travel expenses, uh, not a lot of big money games, and not not a lot of big money programs. Um, you know, it would have been nice if they would have figured out a way to bring those guys along. All right. Well, there's your answer, goon. Gosh, there's so many questions. I'm dry. I have to go through them here. Let's just start with a few of them. Uh, let me see here. Well, well, that's more related to this weekend, so let's, I'm trying to get something more uh, not related to this weekend. Okay, here we go. Charlie, Hockey Bias, wants to know, I feel this year as Shearhorn goes, so goes the Gophers. How far can they go if he plays like he did last year? Your thoughts? So, Viggs, he's basically saying, you know, if Shearhorn's good, we're going to be good. If he's not, we're going to be pretty average. What do you think? Well, I think even this last little stretch, they've been giving up plenty of shots on goal, um, and Shearhorn's answered the bell. Um, I think it's going to be key for them to have good goaltending for them to go anywhere. I don't think this is a perfect team that can go out and really dominate. Um, so I think it's important for Shearhorn to play well if they're going to do anything. All right, Hammy, this one might be more for you since you love to watch the recruits. Charlie, same guy, hockey bias, wants to know, is Jackson Nelson exceeding, or not, expectations with the Stampede? What do you know about this guy? How's he doing? Well, I mean... I mean, you know, he's not lighting it up, but I mean, I think people have to realize that, I mean, you're coming from Southern Minnesota, small school, not great competition, um, you know, and stepping up to the, you know, junior A level USHL. I mean, there's going to be a transition period. Um, I think that, you know, he's still got a couple years left before he's really going to be counted on to be here at the U. So, I mean, I, I don't really think that you're going to be, judging a kid at that stage and saying, you know, is it, is he kicking ass? Is he not, you know, what are the expectations? Um, I mean, I don't know that we would have high expectations of a kid that's 16, you know, or that's in the U S or excuse me, in high school right now. So, I mean, um, you kind of have to be patient, um, you know, and just see how a kid's going to do over the next couple of years. So I don't, I don't see anything that that scares me about him right now that I'm like, oh, my God, he's not doing well. I just think that you have to give a kid for coming from that situation um, enough time to kind of really develop and get used to that kind of level of play because he certainly hasn't had that um, and, you know, when he was at uh, down in southern Minnesota. So, I mean, you just have to be patient. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, people forget that the, the, the junior leagues used to be more for the post-high school kids, but now it's obviously, it's kind of shifted more towards the younger kids, so, but not completely, has it, Viggs? I mean, there's I mean, there's still a lot of older kids, more mature kids playing, so it might take a younger kid a while to really kind of get going on, in, in the junior league. Yeah, and I think, you know, Hammy's right, you know, jumping from Laverne to, to Sioux Falls <laughs> is a pretty big jump. I actually was uh, talking to Patoli today a little bit about the jump from North Dakota to Lincoln, and he remembers his first year in Lincoln. He was getting scratched a fair amount, and 
you know, it's a transition when you change leagues like that. And, you know, it's going to take a while. You know, he is still producing some points here and there, so that's good to see. And, you know, it takes big guys a while to kind of develop into their big bodies and keep up with all those players. And the USHL has been a, a great league. You know, they've got a lot of good players in there now, um, a lot of guys on the central scouting list too. So it's a talented league that's gotten a lot better. Another question, uh, Nate Wells wants to know, Vigo, if you've looked at tomorrow's weather forecast yet. <laughs> not sure what that I means. have. It's it's not t-shirt weather. I'm I'm often you know checking the forecast so I know how to dress in the morning. <laughs> Quite a few people were taken uh, aback at how cold it was on the way to availability today. Jeez, <laughs> oh, were you one of them? Must not have been, huh? <laughs> no, you got to get kids dressed in the morning. You know what the weather is out there. It's yeah. cold. Nate's, so, wear coats and long Nate's so young, no, he doesn't get it yet. I mean, uh, you know, they were talking about you know not knowing really about the Edmonton Oiler dynasty because none of them in, in the Puck Dynasty podcast was alive when the Oilers had their dynasty. So he's young. He doesn't know. He'll have kids one day. He'll learn. Yeah, there's all kinds of young kids at availability now. It's him and Drew and Zeklin. The whole group. They're all a bunch of youngsters. Wow, they never were, they weren't even alive. No. Man, I, remember, I was watching that team at <laughs> Met Center against the North Stars. Yeah, Gretzky and, 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 and well, Messier even older than that, you know, the, the Coffee and all those guys. That the, was the I mean, Islander dynasty me, that, before then. Yep, I mean, it, to <laughs> me, that was my because obviously the North Stars were my favorite team, yeah. but Edmonton was my obviously my second favorite team because I just loved the skill and um, <laughs> that you know it was fun to watch. So um, being able to watch the, you know those great Oiler teams against the North Stars, you know, of the early '80s. I mean, that was. That's some of my favorite memories. I remember that's awesome stuff. Yeah, Nate, we know we're old. That's just how it is. Yeah, what can we do? All right. Well, what else do we have here? Oh, state of hockey. He's always sending us questions. He wants to know. Uh, actually, he sent me a more extensive question. He says, "Is there a beef between Lucia and Leopold?" He says, "When Leo was on Beyond the Pond talking about the national title years, a question was asked about coaching." And he quickly said something along the lines of, our senior class led the charge. Um, yeah. He agreed and kind of found the tone very interesting. And he was kind of wondering our thoughts. You know, I heard that part where what that Lila was talking about on Beyond the Ponds this past Saturday. And he said uh, that that championship team didn't really need coaching because, you know, the leadership kind of led the way. And I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Um, Hammy, uh, do Lucia and Leopold not get along? What's Do we know anything about that? I have I mean, I, I don't hear specifics on some of that kind of stuff. With I, you know, some alums, it's like anything in life. Yep. I mean, it's kind of like when you have a some some of your bosses you really like, some of them you really didn't you know care for too much. Um, you know, and, and I don't, I can't speak specifically about that one. I think people have to remember from Leopold's perspective. I mean, he wasn't recruited to the U by Lucia. I mean, that mm-hmm. senior class that year they weren't Lucia recruits. So, you know, I don't know if that might be part of what he's thinking about with regards, you know, but I mean, it's, they weren't, you know, his class necessarily. And I don't know if maybe that plays into some of his mindset, but um, I I don't know. I think it's a little bit silly to say that. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of kind of revisionist history to say that, I mean, you look at that staff, you had Gensel, you had Motsko, you know, you had, and Lucia, I mean, that's a pretty good coaching staff. And to say that they didn't need coaching, you know, in some respect or another, is a little ridiculous in my my view. But um, well, you nonetheless, know, I think part of that though is that uh, you know, one thing Leopold is, is saying is that uh, it wasn't just you know the coaching part; it was it was the leadership part. And he he did mention about you know uh, there doesn't seem to be the talk of pride on ice anymore, and. Uh, and how that team took control and you know and involved everybody and say this is you know, you know this is this is this is for Minnesota this is you know this we are pride on ice we are the best team but, you know they just had a an, a, a a feeling about them I'm not sure really the right word is but uh, and I, I think that's what he's kind of saying is that there's really not much of that these days I mean um, Viggs we kind of see that in in Cluse. But then, you know, in the post game, we see somebody like a Taylor Camerata who got on the board this this uh, weekend, and and he's wearing a Shattuck tie, 
and he's just kind of blah about being a gopher and the pride on ice stuff. Uh, so, so maybe there is something to it. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think you know your leaders are what hold players accountable. You know, the coaches yeah. can only do so much, especially in today's day and age. You know, you're not going to go out and skate your team. You know. Sunday morning, Monday afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, and then get to Friday and, you know, not have any effort. You know, that's just not going to happen anymore. You need your seniors to step forward and hold everybody else accountable. You know, I didn't hear the context of the interview, so I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I, I don't know what all that was said or whatever, but, you know, I, I do think that there is something to be said for, um, you know, making sure that you have the right, group of guys on the team that take, you know, that look at the situation. I mean, Clues is definitely a guy that really bleeds from burning gold, but, you know, not every guy does that. And I think you, part of that comes down to when you're in the recruiting process, understanding the kinds of players that you are recruiting and do they have that kind of character? Do they kind of seem to have that pride, not just within, you know, the program, but within themselves to, you know what their legacy is, and what they can provide to some, to a team and a program, um, and what they can do for their teammates. I mean, so I, I, it's you know I don't want to get into the whole Cami thing because everybody knows I've gone over that about a thousand <laughs> times over the last few years. So I, I'm not going to go there again. But I mean, I do think that that's kind of an example of you know where you, a coach um, maybe falls in love with what he sees statistically and maybe doesn't put enough emphasis on you know some more of the intangibles that really can matter when you're talking about developing a team and um if there's something that i would say i think the gophers at times have done good jobs with that with certain players but other times i don't know that they've done quite the job that they should as far as placing a little more emphasis on uh the character and and some of the the grit of a player the mental toughness of a player and um, that's where I think that they've maybe failed. When I think back of those championship teams, especially um, the one that Leopold was on, I mean, uh, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of character. There was a lot of grit. And, you know, you, I don't know that they've – I've seen kind of enough of that um, on teams in recent years. They, they might be successful, but there's an element that maybe is missing from some of the intangible point of view. Well, well, the funny thing is, you know, so Leopold is now one of the, the co-hosts on Beyond the Pond on Cafe on, on Saturdays. And, you know, I, I, I believe they, he was asked, you know, who was a player that you, you thought really contributed and, and really was kind of important for you? And the funny thing is, he talked <laughs> about Chad Roberg. He says Roberg got in one game. He, it was an exhibition but it was just the fact that he was a walk-on. He busted his ass. His nickname was Rudy. And that, that was the first person he thought of when he thought of that team was Chad Roberg because of who he was and, and what he meant to the program. And I, I, I found that quite interesting. Oh, well, no thoughts on it? No, I mean, I didn't know what Viggs was going to talk about. As Viggs, did he have to go take care of something? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm back. Oh, okay. So you were a guy. So, okay. Yeah. You, okay. So anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is something to be said for some of those character guys that, um, you know, maybe they just show up and they do their job and they know that they're not going to be kind of the guy that's going to be in the spotlight. And, uh, you know, players respect that. I mean, I think that, or at least most players respect that. And um, it, it is something, you know, it's, it's a testament to him that, you know, that that, a guy that played in the NHL and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and has had success on all levels, and, you know, to make that kind of a comment. So um, it does show you the value of some of the role players. Um, and I do think it comes down to, you know, a certain element of grittiness and, and toughness and kind of doing your job. I, I think back to those gopher teams and, you know, everybody remember John Weibel. It was a big, I mean, you know, and he was, pretty talented kid, you know, considering the role that he played and he did produce for that role. But I mean, players like that, you know, they meant a lot to their team and, you know, maybe some of that has been missing in recent years. I, I'm not to say anything about the, the lower line role player guys, but I mean, I think that, um, 
you know, they sometimes they get underestimated in, in terms of the role that they can play to being a successful team. I do think, you know, you can have all the role players you want in your lineup. You still need your your big knockers to knock. You know, that team did win their titles because of guys like, you know, Leopold, Martin, you know, Batoni, mm-hmm. uh, Vanek. You know, you need guys like that who can produce for any team to go far. Um, so when you look at this year's team, you know, this team's going to need their power plays to be going. They're going to need good goaltending. They're going to need their defensemen to, to not turn the puck over. Now, this isn't a flashy group of guys, you know, but they have talent top to bottom. They've got some depth. So, you know, you can talk about, you know, the Chad Roebergers you want, and, you know, I think that's interesting that that's where Leopold chooses to go, especially when he's going after the coaches. Um, but they had a lot of talent. And I don't think, you know, Roberg is the one that put him over the top. Oh, he might have helped that locker room, but... Yeah. I, I, I think he's really going after the, the kind of person, the character of the person. Um, and I, I think that's what he was more saying. Is back then, a few guys had aspirations of the NHL. Now it seems like just about everybody has aspirations, and that's their, that's their ticket. To, the, it, this is just a stepping stone. Whereas back then, you know, yeah, even 15 years ago, that was not as much the case. Just a little different today, and that's just how well, it, that's just how it is. Well, that, and you, you have to remember back then as well. It was a totally different NHL collective bargaining agreement. I mean, it costs a lot mm-hmm. to sign guys. You know, whereas now it's just basically. I mean, it, yeah, it's not nothing, but it's compared to back then, it's pretty cheap to be able to sign players to deals. And and so, you know, a lot more of these guys probably do have that perspective these days because they see a lot more opportunities, you know, maybe not necessarily in terms of numbers but of opportunities. But, um, you know, the, it's not the huge contracts like it used to be. And so, uh, you know, I think it's being spread out a little bit more, and I think players see more of an opportunity in that sense. Um I don't know. When you look at this team, you look at the the top players on the Gophers right now. I mean, they're not drafted guys. You know what I mean? And so, and one, at least from a forward perspective in terms of production, um, I think that that's kind of where Lucci and them kind of made an adjustment, you know, several years ago is making a little bit more of an emphasis on guys that maybe were skilled players that could produce on a college level but weren't necessarily – you know, going to be high draft picks that had great opportunities to be NHL players. I mean, not that they totally ignore those players either, as as we've seen with Middlestead, for instance. But um, I think that they made a, a little bit more of a concerted effort to kind of blend the team a, a little bit more. And it's not that I think that somebody like Roberg or fourth line guys are going to be the ultimate difference makers, but I do think that people underestimate the value that they bring to the locker room and what they bring to the ice every week. And those great gopher teams that we thought of, you know, 10 plus years ago, they did have very good players in the third and fourth line that produced and, um, you know, for their role. And we probably haven't seen that as much in recent years. And I think that we generally will always have pretty good players that can produce in the top six or in the top four defensively, but um, it's those depth guys that seem to make the real difference uh, for the Gophers when they're having good seasons versus great seasons. Well, definitely, definitely. Time to change, folks. We just kind of have to just kind of have to deal with it. Well, before we hit some more questions by uh, a few people, let's uh, hear from our sponsor, Vintage Minnesota Hockey. VintageMNHockey.com is a proud sponsor of the GPL podcast. Well, what is Vintage MN Hockey? Well, it's kind of the place to get all of your history of Minnesota hockey, from the pros to the minors to the collegiate teams to even the high school teams. All information about any of those teams can be found on VintageMNHockey.com. They also have great interviews with some historical Minnesota hockey figures like John Mayasic and Lou Nanny, Glenn Sonmore, some of the greats of Minnesota hockey. So make sure you check out those interviews. It's a really great thing. But as like I always say, I think my favorite part is the store. The store, you can buy a custom 
historical jersey from the Gophers or the Bulldogs or some of your favorite high school teams. And if you do make a purchase, just use the code GPL Podcast, all one word, and you'll get 10% off your order. So make sure you visit VintageMNHockey.com and follow them on Twitter at VintageMNHockey. Remember, if you have a question for us, you know, even during the week or if you're listening live right now, just jump on Twitter and uh, uh, use the uh, hashtag GPL podcast and we'll try to we'll try to answer your questions. I know we had a couple questions from people using the chat feature on the Mixler live broadcast. So if uh, those guys, same guys in there that were in there last week, if you have any questions for us, we'll try to get to those as well. Um, back to uh, Charlie Hockey Bias. Um, let's give this one to you, Viggs. What do you think? Will Lindgren stay for three plus years? Well, he definitely feels like he could be a three year player. You know, he's he's kind of a steady defenseman, you know, two hundred foot guy who's who's working on that first pass, real tough in his own end. You know, we saw last weekend him getting involved a little bit more in the cycle and, and bringing his offensive game. Uh, the game he got a goal. You know, he jumped into the rush, um, but he's he's a guy who's who's gonna develop at Minnesota very well on the big ice. You know, he's a guy who's gonna have more time with the puck on his stick at Minnesota. Um, he's a Boston pick, so it kind of depends a little bit for them. You know what their cap situation is. I know Hammy was talking about it. it's cheap to sign guys. Well, guys in the NHL need cheap players because of the the salary cap, and it's gonna stay the same next year as it is this year. Uh, so teams could be in a little bit of cap trouble. So I think that more than anything could decide where he's going to go. But he definitely feels like a player who wants to stick around for a little bit. Um, uh, next year he's got a great chance to be the captain of the World Junior team too. Yep, he's still a youngster, folks, so let's try not to get rid of him yet. Uh, Hammy, any thoughts on Lindgren staying for uh, at least a few more years? Well, I mean, that would be my expectation. I, I don't see a guy. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting that people are talking about a guy that's got five points on the year. You know, granted, he is a defenseman, but it's not like he's lighting the sky either. You know, um, he's a good all around player, and I think that there's a lot of long term um, positives with him. But I think that this is not a guy that I would suspect would be um, on the, the fast track either. So I think that people need to. I know it's sort of, you know, like I said, it's cheaper to sign players, and um, I think people get gun shy because they see guys go maybe a little sooner than they would like at times. But uh, I think you know we're barely over halfway through his freshman season. I think we can kind of calm back, calm down on those <laughs> kinds of those kinds of questions. Um, State of Hockey wants to know: uh, looking ahead after Middlestead, is there another elite prospect on the radar, Hammy? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, by prospect, he means like current recruit or what do we, I mean, cause that's I, the hard thing to say. Yeah. I mean, you know, and what is he going to consider? Elite? You know, how's he going to class? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what I that's mean? That's just the it's word like, of the week is a fleck, but, uh, right. I get that. But I, it's like, you know, we're talking about a kid who's going to be, you know, in the top 10 of an NHL draft. Is that his definition of elite? Cause I don't think. You know, I think personally, um, people overrate the whole NHL draft process. You know that stuff because ultimately we're talking about college hockey. As much as um, I know, some fans and I, you know, in particular, get all hyped up about that kind of stuff. But I mean, ultimately, we are talking about the college level. It, it's great to have players that move on and be, have, are successful at the NHL level, but. Um, you know, it's like ultimately we care about how they're going to produce in college, and after they leave, that's great. Have, have all the success in the world. Hope you're great. But um, I, you know, I, if he's going to say, "Do we have another guy in the top ten of the NHL draft that that we have in our recruit list?" I would say no. But uh, if you're asking, "Do we have some impact players that are going to be very good in the college level?" I'd say yes. But um, I, it's hard for me to define based on that question what he's looking for but i think we're looking at you know brock besser luke cunning casey middlestat is there a next player that could hit college hockey and step right in and score 20 goals yeah well and i don't i don't see that guy guys, right now well that's the thing you have to say right now because a lot of these guys are still two plus years away i mean 
it's you you have to project. I mean, even the NHL scouts with all their resources and whatever, they get first round NHL draft picks. They get wrong. You know what I mean? So um, it is a little bit of a crapshoot, even for the very best of uh, you know situations for NHL scouts. So. Um, We'll just have to see how it pans out. I, I, I do like a lot of the guys that they have in the pipeline. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that I would like to see them do better is it'll be a little bit better with some of their defensive recruiting. Um, I, as we've seen with the current lineup, there's been some whiffs, you know, and I think that usually when I've seen them make whiffs, it's been when they've kind of reached for guys with you know too young that maybe had some of the size elements and some of that, but maybe... Um, overlooked some players that, you know, didn't necessarily have the ideal, you know, physical traits. Um, so I think that they have to be a little bit more careful in that respect. But um, I, I like a lot of what they have in the pipeline. All right. That's a lot of questions we've gone through tonight. should probably get on to actually talking more about to who the Gophers play this week. And, uh, Hammy... Penn State's coming to town. They've had a pretty good season. They've been uh, at the top of the, the college hockey rankings um, not too long, a week or so ago. And uh, obviously they've struggled a little more recently. Obviously a lot of us think their schedule's inflated, uh, but it still comes back to uh, they were winning games. And when you win games, you do get confidence. And uh, um, Penn State will not be a, a, an easy, an easy uh, win this weekend for either of the games. Well, I don't know that, you know, I would say that they'll be easy, but I, I can't argue with some of the commentary about their schedule. I mean, when you look at their schedule, they played five road games, essentially. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, two at Ohio State, two at Notre Dame, one at Mer- I mean, and then the ones that they have played at home, for the most part, have been up until, essentially, Ohio State. I mean, I wouldn't say that that's exactly a murderer's row of, um, of great teams. So, I mean... It, to me, there are still some definite big question marks um, regarding that team, and and you know being away from home um, against a good Gopher team that has been tested certainly a lot more than Penn State has been. I, I can see why people would you know feel that the way that they do. I mean, they have the what right now the 35th ranked strength of schedule, so it hasn't been a great schedule, and it's been very uh, heavily dominated by home games. So. Um, to me, this, you know, if the Gophers play the way that they're capable of, especially like what we saw, you know, against UMD for a chunk of that game, uh, I, they should win both games. But, you know, it still remains to be seen. I think that they have to do a good job. Penn State likes to throw a lot of pucks on net, and um, I think they have to be pretty good about, you know, making sure that they control the rebounds and box out players and not give up rebounds, um, you know, to players coming in for that second opportunity. So I, I think that that's the key, I think, from a defensive perspective. And offensively, I like our, you know, I think that we have a lot of skill and a lot of power play players that can be successful. So, I mean, I think that we have to be very good on the special teams as well. So, But I think that this is going to be a good weekend for the Gophers. Um, but I'll probably regret saying that a week from now. But um, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, that this is an opportunity to really do some damage, you know, from a Gopher perspective in the conference. And, um, so I, I look forward to good things this weekend. Well, Viggs, it's definitely a key weekend point-wise because, you know, Penn State's only two points back. Uh, they have the, the same amount of losses, just that one extra tie. Um, you got Wisconsin tied with Minnesota with the same record. They're playing Michigan State this weekend. So the, this is a key weekend, I mean, to show Penn State who's still on top. Uh, and, you know, that Wisconsin's back and we need to keep winning to stay ahead. Yeah, I kind of looked at this month for Penn State as the show me month for them. It is. <laughs> you know, they're, they're playing six games here, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, where they're going to be tested. I think uh, Penn State does rely a lot on getting volume of pucks to the net, and if your goalie's not sharp against that, you know, you could have a long night. You know, but Shearhorn's looked steady lately. He does better when he sees kind of that constant stream of shots. And Penn State coming to Mariucci, the big ice, I think playing on that big ice for them is a challenge because those shots from the wall are basically turnovers. So I think that's a big opportunity for Minnesota to get some momentum. Um, 
you know, the defense hasn't been real flashy, but they've been pretty solid on their retrievals and first passes. I think it's going to be real big on, on the wings and, and center to gain that blue line and get Penn State moving back. Um, special teams, I think the Gophers finally have, like, the right setup with their forwards. Um, they've got everybody in the right spot with, you know, the right hands on their off wing and the left hands on their off wing. And I think that's, that's big for this team. Um, so we'll see what happens this weekend, but I'm not expecting Minnesota to struggle. I think this is a, should be a sweep for them. Okay. Well, I noticed one thing you heard today at, uh, at media day with the uh, coach Lucia is that, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that, you know, special teams are as important but he also said that, you know, they need to kind of pick up the pace a little bit on the power play. Yeah, I think when they had Novak on the power play unit, when he was starting the year on his off wing, he was really successful. But I think as the, the Gophers try to get Rem Petlick on the power play, they kind of force some pieces into the wrong place to get him that opportunity. Um, now that Novak's out of the lineup, they're not doing that anymore. They're getting people in the right positions. Um, and I think that's an encouraging sign for them. Um, you know, Pitlick's a dangerous player, but when they had to put him out there and then they put Novak on the wrong side, it really limits the options and everything slowed down. And it's never really picked back up. Uh, so hopefully as these guys get some familiarity with one another, they can pick up the pace. You're on mute, Ju. Sorry, did it again. Here, I'm sitting there talking again. Not being heard. It's probably a good thing. Um, Wisconsin's tied for first place, guys. Did you guys see this happening this quickly? Any of you? After seeing them play Minnesota, I did. Okay. You know, this Wisconsin team's good. Um, the issue early in the year was their goaltending was really inconsistent. Um, I watched a little bit about that game uh, against Ohio State, and they got good goaltending. Mm-hmm. Um, so Wisconsin's going to be a threat this year. A good goaltending and good center play can get you a long ways. Well, that's a good thing, though, isn't it, Hammy? With regard to them Wisconsin being, being competitive good again. again? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been saying that, you know, that for the Big Ten to really kind of pick up its, you know, where it should be at, you know, Wisconsin's got to be a part of that. And as much as we liked, you know, <laughs> seeing them struggle, and, you know, we, but it's more fun to have success and beat an opponent uh, that you're a rival with when they're you know got some good players and good teams um you know when we went in there last year and completely destroyed them you know on their home ice it was kind of like a yawner it was like what a joke you know yeah. and um you know as much as we like to win four nothing and nine two against a, a <laughs> rival you know you kind of want to do that when it's when they're a good team versus when they're a complete disaster so um, in a sense, yes, it's good for the league. Um, and, you know, I think it'll add to the rivalry moving forward, you know, that if they're playing well and have some competitive teams, uh, it's certainly going to get that rivalry back to where we want it to be. So, Viggs, uh, what else are we going to hear uh, on the post-game audio today that we always throw at the end of the podcast? Uh, what player did we get today? Well, we got Ryan Collins. Okay. Uh, I missed the player availability. I'm working on a story on uh, Grant Petolny for this weekend. Cool. So I had to, I had to head out early to uh, to get started on that. Uh, but it's attached. I think uh, you get Ryan Collins and um, another Ford, probably probably Brent Gates. But I'm not <laughs> sure about that. So they got two players, but I wasn't there to drill them for questions. <laughs> what about Coach Lucia? Obviously, he mentioned you know some of the speed and moving the puck better on special teams what else is he uh talking about yeah but he also talked about what they got to do to be um successful against penn state um he talked a little bit about penn state's rise as a program yep. you know they've done it the right way you know they had a big money donor come in and get them a great facility um they're in a great recruiting spot with the east coast michigan canada mm-hmm. all within driving distance um you know pj fleck talked about that eight hour drivable distance is fertile recruiting ground. Well, Penn State's in a great spot for that. Um, you know, Pagula came and looked at Mariucci and a couple of the other arenas around here when they're, you know, putting their stuff together. Um, so he talked a little bit about that as well. All right. Well, also, um, oh, go ahead. we might see um, Maroney in the lineup this weekend. 
Um, he played on Smetula's wing today in practice. Um, Lucia did stay in the North Star College Cup that he wanted to get Murray in the lineup. He did. Um, he just didn't think uh, Duluth or Bemidji were a good matchup for him. Uh, maybe Penn State's a good spot for him to get in the lineup again because the you know, you got to see what you got in games with these guys. You know, you can practice all you want, but games are a little something different. So, sweeper go home this weekend, guys. Hammy, <laughs> that's my feeling. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna. Yep. I expect to make the majority of the points for the weekend, but uh, you know, but I do think that we're the better team, and I think we should be, especially at home ice. I would agree. Um, yep. We've had good success against Penn State, so I, I expect us to do well, but. Um, we'll just, they still have to show up and play the game, so we'll see how it goes. They definitely do, and this is a good time to start being consistent, Minnesota. But we will winning. say that they're in good enough shape pairwise where this is not a must-win weekend. You know, I think the Big Ten's got a good chance of having two, maybe even three teams in the tournament this year. That's true. With the Wisconsin on the rise, they're, they finally became ranked for the first time in a few years this week. They're on the rise. Obviously, Penn State's top ten. Ohio State's uh, kind of a bubble team, but they could eat. You know, we could have three or four if, you know, some teams start playing better. But uh, right now it's looking like a good solid three teams. I mean, especially with Wisconsin on the rise. I mean, you just never know. So we shall see, boys. Anything else for this week? Anything else interesting going on? I think that's about it. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, remember, you can always... You, you would have known half of this stuff if you got if you were following Vigo because Vigo tweets out all this stuff when he's uh, following, you know, listening to Lucia Media Day. So you would have known half this stuff if you follow him. So get over there, follow him, and Hammy. Follow him too at Hammy Hockey. That's all. Yeah, we have. I don't comment that. I don't comment that much. Yeah, these you're days, you're but. a little quieter, but uh, we'll just have to see. So we'll be back next week. We're going to recap the sweep of Penn State. Yes, it's going to be a sweep. And then we'll uh, preview Ohio State. They're heading on the road out to Columbus next week. Until then, thanks for listening. Very much a volume shooting team. Uh, they, they go to the net as well as every, anybody. Uh, it's something that our goaltender has to do a good job with rebound control, kicking pucks away, um, taking whistles. Uh, from a defensive standpoint, we're going to have to do a good job of boxing out uh, and taking care of that area of the blue paint and, and have good, clean you know, retrievals and, and getting, getting out of our own zone. So um, good team. Uh, they, they put themselves in a, in a great position. And obviously the next few weeks are going to be real critical with back in, in Big Ten play. So uh, for us, you know, what we're stressing, you know, team defense, discipline, you know, taking care of a puck. Um, how, how important that is this time of the year as, as we get down to the end. Uh, how important will the power play be this weekend in well, terms of how successful it's been so far? It, it's always important to, that, I mean, you got to get some power play goals, and that, that, that's a, a battle within the battle, especially teams. And, you know, our penalty kill continues to improve and, and get better. Um, the power play, you know, I haven't been in, even though we've scored some goals, I haven't been in, as in love with it as maybe I was a little bit earlier. So uh, we got to get back to moving the puck a little bit more quickly. We got to get back to a better net front presence, whether it's five on five or certainly on the power play. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll work on it and, you know, try to have a little bit better execution. But to me, we've just been a little bit slow in, in moving the puck from, you know, one point to the next. Penalty kill has been uh, one of the top of the nation the past uh, about ten games or so uh, after being maybe one of the worst of the last season. What do you kind of credit towards the change? Um, well, we've got some veteran guys on it. Uh, you look at uh, the only guy we lost on our penalty kill last year was Hudson, um, and you know so I think another year that the experience they had last year was important. Um, same with the same thing with our D. Uh, we had some new guys that, that, that played. Um, we spent we're spending a lot more time on it because we know how important that is. And you know, you get back and ultimately, you know, cost us at the end when we give up what two or three power play goals against Michigan in the last game, and season's over. So we we've, we've dedicated two to three days a week in our practice schedule to to our penalty kill on different aspects of it. And you know, Mike Mike's in charge of it and does a great job with it. And I know it was a sense of frustration for him. And uh, obviously the best penalty killer is your goalie. And early on I think, you know, they're uh, 
Eric needed to make a couple saves on the penalty kill too to bail our guys out, and, and that's important. And now he's been doing that on a more consistent basis. And and all of a sudden, that uh, if you're only giving up one or two shots on the power play, uh, the goaltender's got to make some saves too. And he's he's done a good job with that. It's funny how, you know, maybe we're almost giving up more shots now than what we were, but he's making more saves. Now that you've been playing Penn State for a few years, does it feel like you're starting to build some tradition with, with this matchup? Well, I think you, you, you're building how a team plays. And, you know, it's kind of funny. And it's how it was, you know, in other leagues too. I mean, you play a team and you know their style and how they're going to play. So, I mean, you can kind of plug in the video and, you know, okay, yeah, I know we're playing Penn State because they're going to shoot and they're going to crash the net and they're going to play, get up and down the rink. Um, they're a, usually a very deep team and a four-line team. They just roll their guys, and they've never been too concerned about, you know, um, who who's out against who. They just they're going to play their guys, and, and that's their mentality. Uh, they've they've built a nice program, and when you look at uh, the commitment that the institution made, and obviously Mr. Pagula uh, to donate that amount of money, and I think his dream is is paid off when, you know, they sell out every game, and it's a you know six seven six thousand whatever the rink holds. Um, they have a good atmosphere. It's a nice facility to play in, um, and and uh, I think when they when they decided to add hockey, that was their vision, and it, it's come to fruition. How impressive is it that just a couple of years ago they had pup kids on the team, and now a couple of weeks ago? Well, it's it's it's, it's it's five years, and then you look at. I mean, most a lot of times you don't have guys more than three years, so you know they've they had a chance to start fresh. They're in a, they're in a, actually a good spot recruiting wise. Uh, I mean, because you can drive to the East Coast, you can drive up to Canada and Michigan, you know, so you go 300 miles in a radius around State College, you can get to some, you know, pretty good grounds. And then, um, you know, one of their assistants has roots here back in Minnesota, so, you know, they're back here playing games, and, you know, so um, they're, they're recruiting in Minnesota as well, uh, um, and they've done a, a, a nice job. Do you think it'd be good for the Big Ten if they're able to sustain some of this success and, and be a, a top 10 team for years to come? Well, I think it's it's good for the Big Ten that, you know, more teams are doing well this year. That you look right now and, and uh, you know, Wisconsin's rebound like you knew they would. You know, Notre Dame's coming in, so, you know, Michigan's a pretty – I just think we're on the cusp of, you know, the Big Ten being re- really, really good. Are you surprised at how quickly Penn State has become competitive? No, because it's, you know, it's been a half a dozen years now. I mean, you, you have a chance to go out and recruit and start over, and it's a – you know, everybody's heard of Penn State. I mean, you, you go out recruiting, I don't care if you're in Ontario or British Columbia or Minnesota or, um, you know, Boston. I mean, Penn State's a name brand school. So with it comes credibility. And, and when you have invested and, you know, built a nice facility to play in, that, you know, you know you're on par with everybody. You what mentioned Coach is- Fisher being from here. He said he came to see Mariucci before they, they built Pagula. Do you remember them visiting here to sort of... Yeah, I actually, I do remember, um, you know, uh, Mr. Pagula here um, sitting in the office and talking about Division One hockey, and I think that that's what they did. I mean, I think most people now, when they're going to build a new facility, I remember when, you know, North Dakota was building them, being, they were out at, you know, uh, Ralph Ingolstadt was out at CC, and, you know, with Dean, and they were taking a tour around the newer facilities and to see what they liked and, you know, what they didn't like. And like anything... Uh, we were at, at that era where there was probably 10 or 15 new college hockey rinks that were built, and you can go around and look, and you can kind of take what, what you like and what you don't and formulate it into your own plans, and especially with that, it, when you know money really wasn't an object. Did, did you have any uh, big words for them? Or, or no, I don't. You know, like no. I mean, he, I, hey, he's a pretty good businessman. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> I'm not giving him any advice. <laughs> I, I ask him about how to invest money. <laughs> what can a series like this where both teams come in ranked in the top ten do to help build a rivalry? Well, uh, you know, I, I think some rivalries, uh, it was interesting when um, – when we moved to the Big Ten, where in in um, in the old WCHA, you could probably say we were everybody's main rival a lot. You know, seven or eight of the teams. I think in the Big Ten, it's a little bit more probably football related, maybe for like, not for the players or coaches, but if you said the student body. I, and I would imagine that if you asked Ohio State, you know, who their fans want to beat, it's pretty obvious. It's Michigan. And I would bet that if you ask Penn State. Who they want to beat? It's probably Michigan, Ohio State. You know, obviously we have that tradition in hockey, uh, but I, I think some of the rivalries within the Big Ten are specific as much to, you know, football uh, and, and the other sp- or basketball and those sports as much as anything else. Obviously, we have ours with Wisconsin. I would probably say right now our second biggest rival in the Big Ten would be um, Michigan uh, as of now. 
but at the same time, some time, some of it is, you know, where the coach is from. You know, what, what, what for them, what Stokes. I mean, if you you got Steve Rollick and Mark Strobel from Hill Murray High School, I'm sure they want to beat the Gophers. You know, just maybe maybe a player from Canada doesn't have that same feeling. Uh, but I, I think it's helped playing four games a year rather than all of a sudden you're on a rotation where you only play twice a year. Uh, and even next year with Notre Dame coming in, when you when you go into everybody's building, and you do have a true champion when you play four games a year. And I, I think that's one of the things I like about it versus, you know, some leagues you, you could win a championship based on, you know, who your four and two game opponents are or who you play at home or who, who you play on the road and that, that type of situation because we saw that happen before. So I think people are getting more and more comfortable. Uh, when you look at right now, um, you know, we're in the top ten. Penn State is. Ohio State's just on the cusp. You know, Wisconsin's, you know, having a good year. I mean, Notre Dame where they're at in Hockey East. Um, so I, I think the – you know the future looks very good. I just, I think people have made a lot out of nothing the last couple of years, and I think it's just it's going to be a good league. It is a good league, and it's going to continue to be become better. A word that was thrown around a lot recently has been depth. Um, so how have you been working towards getting the core to produce more, and how important is it? Well, you? it's you know your there's an old saying you know your best players have to be your best players when you get to this time of the year. So we know who who those guys are. They've been identified, but I, I think what becomes critical as you get to this juncture, you have to have some secondary guys step up. Like Ryan Norman's got a goal each of the last two weekends, you know. So I, I think those are those are important aspects of our team. Like I thought, uh, I call it our blue line with Romenko and Ramsey and Norman last weekend was the best they've played since the first month of the season. And I've always been confident in them defensively, but. They just they did a better job of in the offensive zone and generating scoring chances, and it just makes us a better team. And when, when we get that that from throughout our lineup, you know, we still we're still trying to you know figure out who should be playing with uh, Smetula right now uh, on that right side. We've we've moved some guys around, and we'll continue to move some guys around until we find out you know who who that person is. You mentioned after Saturday's game, you want to try to get uh, Maroney in uh, mm-hmm. this week. You still trying to do that? Yeah, I mean, uh, he's practiced. He practiced today on the black line with with Smetula. Whether he, you know, stays there tomorrow, we'll, we'll talk as a staff. Or, but um, you know, sometimes until guys play, you don't know, and and uh, they need a chance. You know, I've had guys that I've coached that are better in games than they are in practice, and. Um, you know, he brings a certain element. He hasn't had a chance to play a lot, but, you know, when he, when he does, has played, you know, his speed is obviously noticeable. Um, and and uh, so there's some spots to be had right now, and that's what we got to try to find out here over, the, you know, the next month or so. Everyone healthy? Uh, yeah, actually we are right now. The key for a team like Penn State is getting volume to the net and traffic to the net and creating chaos after shots. What kind of challenge does that present? Well, I think it, I think it's a couple things. Um, obviously, you don't want to lot, you get beat up the rank because their deal be very active jumping up. Uh, I think goaltenders got a big responsibility to, to kick pucks away from the net, whether it's to the corners, whether it's you take faceoffs and just stop the chaos with a whistle. Um, I, uh, you know, defensemen have to do a good job boxing out and getting pucks out of that danger area. I think those are all important things for us uh, this weekend. What's that emphasis for your smaller forward? Pardon? Smaller forwards and all those battles with rebounds. And- yeah, well, I mean, it's only one of them. I mean, you got your D. They're, they're the main guys. And, and uh, you know, it's not about how big you are. It's about, um, you know, positioning and, you know, get, being able to lift up a guy's stick. I mean, it's, you don't have to be 6'4 to do that. It's leverage. Yeah. All right? Thank okay. you. He's in the Big Ten. What, what is it like to play against Penn State? Do you see them as, as an upcoming team? Yeah, I mean, it's always fun to play against good teams, and, uh, you know, Penn State's one of them. Uh, they're, they're definitely up and coming in the Big Ten. They've proved that uh, the past few years that they're going to be a tough opponent to play against, and that's, that's good for us, and that's good for the Big Ten. Have you guys started to develop any kind of, like, feeling towards them? Are they a team that you like to play, you don't like to play, you expect a certain style? Uh, I mean, I, I can say we, just, we expect a certain style. Um, they're they're one of the highest scoring teams in the country. They're one of the highest shot percentage teams in the country. You know, they take the most shots. So um, we know they're a team that wants to play offensively. They want to get the puck to the net as much as possible, and they really like to crash the net. So that's kind of the, the MO of, of Penn State. What does that mean you guys have to do as a group of defensemen then? Well, I think that means we need to, we need to clear the front of the net and let uh, Eric Shearhorn see the puck. 
Um, it's important that we're not turning the puck over because they're a transition team, and they, when they get the puck, they want to make one pass and shoot. So we know if we turn the puck over, that it's going to be on our net pretty quickly. It's an important series. Both teams ranked in the top ten. What can that do to help build some more rivalry between the Gophers and Penn State? Uh, I think it can do a lot. I mean, both teams are uh, are in a pretty good spot in terms of pairwise and Big Ten. Um, you know, two wins either way can can kind of put a team behind you in the Big Ten race, and uh, it is a race this year so far. So, uh, I mean, I think it's it's very important, especially two teams like us that have ranked very closely in, in both um, both rankings, uh, can really make a difference come the end of the year. Helen Nikhil has been one of the tops in the nation over the past 10 games. Uh, kind of struggled throughout much of last year. What do you think is the biggest change? Um, you know, it's, that's hard to, hard to put a finger on. I mean, I think um, we focus on it. Um, everything's kind of clicking. I think some of it has to do with, with chemistry. I mean, we have D pairs and, and forward penalty kill pairs that have been together um, kind of all year, and everyone's starting to form. Uh, some chemistry with their penalty kill partners and form some some chemistry as a penalty kill unit in total. Is there a difference in playing Penn State and their uh, shot volume style here on the Olympic size ice versus a Pagula? Uh, I I think a little bit. I mean, you don't play it a whole lot differently, but um, with the with the big ice, you can try. To, you want to try to keep them to the, to the outside, and if they're taking shots from the outside of the rink uh, on Mariucci. It's going to be a little different than um, taking shots on the outside of Pagula. So uh, I think the focus for us is we know they're going to shoot. Um, wh- whatever size the ice is, we need to keep the front of the net clear. Thank you. Thank you. Penn State comes to town now as, as a top 10 team. Do you think it could be good for the conference if, if they're able to continue the kind of success that they've had this year as a new program? Yeah, I mean... It's always good having good competition at a conference, and if we play well against them, that just uh, is better for us when we're looking at the rankings at the end of the year. Have you guys started to develop some like feelings toward Penn State, like you might have towards other rivals, where you you know you really want to crush them, or you you you're highly motivated to play in this series? Is there anything happening there with the rivalry? I mean, I've only been here a year. Um, I guess we've. We've done pretty well against them in the past, and we we uh, we swept them. Or no, we didn't sweep them. We split both series with them last year. Um, I guess for me, there hasn't been as much of a rival as some other teams so far. Yeah, and that's the, because of the newness of the. Yeah, and it's yeah. It's, I guess it's just because they're new. To and as us. I think about that, um, do you think maybe part of that is because guys that are playing here? Penn State's a newish program, so guys that you cheered for when you were watching and, and growing up and you were kids, Penn State wasn't on the map yet. Yeah, I guess the rivalries were built a long time ago, and it takes quite a long time to form a rivalry, and maybe that's just why we haven't seen that as much yet. But it is a battle for first place. It is it is a battle for first place, so it's going to... So how tough is this weekend? It will be a tough series. It's going to be a fun series, and... From what we've heard, they get a lot of shots and they play well. And I don't know, it'll be a good test. What's the most important factor to take the momentum away from them? Um, I think just shut down their offense because they score a lot each night and we just need to prevent that. Uh, last weekend, uh, Coach Lucia regarded your line. He mentioned him in after Saturday's game, saying you were, your, your line was one of the most solid all weekend. Um, how are you going to look to translate that game, that, that hard four-check, back-check game you had going? Um, I think for last weekend, we were just playing with a little more snarly mentality. Um, we got the puck low. We worked it. Um, I guess, I don't know, those in-state rivals are just, they get, they get people going. And I had fun playing against them and just, I don't know. Last weekend was the first weekend without Tommy Novak in the lineup. How do you feel you guys were able to fill in without him, and how do you need to play in the future knowing that he won't be there for you? We just need to, f- I mean, we just need to play like he hasn't been with us all season. Um, it hurts us that he's gone, but guys step up and we fill out their roles, and we just need to keep playing how we're playing. We lost here to Ohio State 8-3, to and I've gone 8-2 since. Was that loss at home the bottom of the barrel? That 
Yes, that was the bottom of the barrel. And I don't think that will happen again this year. Um, we've been playing good since then, and it's just – I think it kind of flipped a switch in us, turned our mentality around. Um, we've been playing differently since then, and it's more of a mentality to play towards the end of the year. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Um, playing – yep. Yeah, um, so – Play more defensively, I guess, because, um, you know, they say defense wins championships, and that's what we need to do, and that's how we need to play, and we're competing for a championship. We're first in the league right now, and we want to stay there.